<laughs> I'm Mark Mercer, the president of SAFS, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. The lecture tonight, including the discussion period, is being recorded and will be posted on the internet in coming weeks. Right, so you've, uh, by being here, you are consenting uh, that your image be on, uh, on the internet if the camera happens to, uh, to hit you, but it probably won't. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the good work of Will McNally in helping to put together our annual general meeting this year. Thank you, Will. <laughs> SAFS, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, has been around for over 30 years now. The Society promotes academic freedom, freedom of expression on campus, the use of academic criteria in academic decisions, and academic excellence and the health and the vibrancy of the university in general. We promote academic values and the academic mission in a number of ways. SAFS sends letters to university administrators when we believe that academic freedom or the merit principle uh, or academic uh, integrity have been violated or put at risk. Three times a year, SAFS publishes a newsletter of mainly original articles, mainly by SAFS members. And throughout each year, SAFS sponsors events at which SAFS themes are discussed and debated. Among those events is the annual general meeting and the Freddie Lecture. Uh, the Freddie Lecture this evening. SAFS is entirely a member-supported and member-driven organization. We have no staff. Everything we do, we do through the voluntary efforts of, its, of our members. Members are encouraged to write for the newsletter, to organize events on SAFS themes uh, on their campuses or in their towns. Right now, SAFS has about 353 members uh, only 276, however, fully paid up. Uh, some, <laughs> some, uh, some, have, some have let their membership lapse a year or two. Uh, most of our members are academics working in Canadian universities or, or retired from Canadian universities. Uh, but also among our members are journalists, doctors, engineers, and we have members in the States and internationally. Membership is only $25 a year, $15 for students and the unemployed or retired. Contact me if you would like to join. Before I turn the mic over to Andrew Lawton, who will introduce Joanna Williams, this year's Freddie Lecture, let me say a couple things about the Freddie Lecture. Officially, uh, this is entitled the Annual, John and, uh, the Annual Chris and John Freddie Lecture on the Contemporary University. Uh, but I agree that that title, though accurate, doesn't sing, so uh, we just call it the Ferretti Lecture. Chris Ferretti and John Ferretti were instrumental in starting the society and were among its original members. John was the second SAFS president, I'm the fifth. Chris is a retired urban studies professor from York University. John, who died in 2016, was a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. Because of their importance to the history of SAFS and because of their commitment to academic values and their support of the society, SAFS is delighted to honor Chris and John with our flagship lecture series. Joanna will speak for 40 minutes, 45 minutes uh, or so, and then, uh, the answer, uh, then answer questions and engage in discussion with audience members for another 45 minutes. If, the dis if in the discussion period you wish to ask a question or offer a comment, just raise your hand. Andrew Lawton is a senior journalist at True North and host of The Andrew Lawton Show and a longtime member of the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. It's always a pleasure for me at the annual general meeting to visit with Andrew and hear what's been happening in the world of politics. Andrew's written for many newspapers and magazines and his book, The Freedom Convoy, The Inside Story of Three Weeks That Shook the World, just about a year old now, sold extremely well and is very highly regarded. Andrew. Thank you very much. It's always a great compliment when the introducer gets an introduction, so I appreciate that very much. And I, I am a SAFS member, I'd be here regardless, but I also live 10 minutes from here, so it was really convenient. And my membership was paid, which was, I think, a prerequisite of being invited here. I'm going to speak about uh, tonight's keynote uh, lecturer in just a moment, but I, I want to begin, if I may, by talking about where we are not doing this tonight, 
And that is the London Public Library, which is just uh, down the street, some direction. It doesn't really matter. And because we're not allowed there. Uh, if you did not catch the news, this talk, which is entitled Sex, Gender, and the Limits of Free Speech, was limited at the Wolf Performance Hall, which did an audit through which they demanded an advanced copy of her PowerPoint slides and a lecture outline to assess whether it would violate their policies. Now, Mark Mercer, being the dutiful steward of staff, sent along examples of other, I would say, relatively uncontroversial in the grand scheme of things conversations, like you know, biological sex is real. And <laughs> this was evidently too controversial for the London Public Library, which uh, said to be there would be a violation of the workplace harassment and sexual harassment policies and would be likely to cause physical danger to participants and would impede the ability for everyone else to enjoy the library, which is a bit of an, I don't know if anyone's not enjoying their hotel stay, maybe they had a point, but I think people were still in the pool down there, so it seems like we haven't impeded any enjoyment of anything by being here. But this is the norm. So I want to just mention, I mean, Joanna Williams has done tremendous things. I'm just going to read a couple of the things for which she's known. She has glorified the unrepentant terrorist Layla Khaled. She has publicly engaged in anti-Semitic... Sorry, this is a guy who's speaking at the library tomorrow. <laughs> I, I, I'm so sorry, Joanna. I got my biographies mixed up. Yeah, I just learned today there is a a comedian performing at the library. Now, nothing's as funny as talking about how great Hamas is. It, uh, just, I'm, I'm, I'm in stitches just thinking about it. Uh, but uh, there's a guy, Amer Zar, who is, uh, you know, he praises, I'm looking at the greatest hits here. He uh, says we shouldn't uh, denounce white, uh, or we shouldn't denounce uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, we should uh, praise terrorists. He called one terrorist his Valentine. Everyone's a romantic these days. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and there's a whole uh, thing here. Yeah, so he's at the library tomorrow. Uh, so if the talking about free speech gets old, uh, Joanna, you can always just pivot to uh, good old-fashioned anti-Semitism, and you won't be banned from speaking at your next visit to London. This is the situation in which we exist and in which this discussion is taking place. So Joanna Williams has the distinct privilege of now being banned in two Londons, which is something that uh, very few people are able to claim. Uh, she is from England, and she's the founder and director of the CIEO, and is a weekly columnist for Spiked, which is something you must add to your reading list if it's not already. And if you don't see her there, you're likely to see her at The Times, The Spectator, The Daily Mail, on telly, as my Brit British relatives say, and as I say to annoy my wife, and in a myriad of other platforms, she is someone who is tremendously, tremendously knowledgeable about the topics that give SAFs its raison d'etre. She is someone who has written about wokeness in the academy. She wrote a great book called How Woke Won. She is also uh, the author of Women Versus Feminism, Academic Freedom in an Age of Conformity and Consuming Higher Education, Why Learning Can't Be Bought. And I think it is safe to say that by not being able to have this event where we wanted the woke have one, and Joanna will certainly be able through her work to tell you why, but it is my distinct privilege to welcome this year's keynote speaker, Joanna Williams. I thank you, Andrew, but I think you've given me a really hard act to follow there, so I'm not sure I really do thank you. Uh, but seriously, though, I, I thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you, Mark. Mark. Mercer, thank you very much for organising this and for SAFs for hosting. Um, but I think the people we really do need to thank tonight are the London Public Library um, for giving us so much publicity, for attracting the crowds here this evening and, and proving really that, that every attempt to, to censor, to ban, actually backfires. It creates publicity, it gets the word out, it, it doesn't actually prove to be successful in the end. I, I wasn't going to kick off immediately by talking about the events of the past few days. Obviously, uh, I hadn't expected them to happen a week ago when I was thinking about what to say. Uh, but it seems too good an opportunity to miss. And I think there are some real important lessons. In fact, it, it proves every single point 
I wanted to make over the course of this speech, hooray, <laughs> proves every single point, thank you, I wanted to make, I mean, almost to the point where you can just kind of throw my prepared speech in the bin and just talk about what's happened over the past few days as being absolutely exemplary and a real typical way that censorship works nowadays. Um, so just a few thoughts to kick off with. I mean, why it seems to me a real textbook example of censorship. The way that, that me um, expressing views, obviously just in words, just talking, is conflated with danger and violence and even threats of physical attack. And that equation of words with violence is something that we've come to be quite used to nowadays. I mean, just to reassure people, I would probably be quite useless if it did actually come to a fight and uh, certainly have no weapons or anything like that. I'm not planning to resort to violence this evening and, and kind of makes me laugh really the suggestion that, that there is anything that I could do that would be dangerous or violent. Um, but the other thing I thought was very typical is the way there's not even an attempt to engage or to really justify their reasons for not holding the event. It's, it's a cowardly hiding behind bureaucracy. It's a computer says no attitude. It's pointing at policies. It's kind of referring you to policy three, subsection four, bullet point five. And, and it, I think that's cowardly in the extreme because it's saying we're not actually going to engage in a dialogue with you. They're not going to say what it is that they're worried about, that, that I might say that, that's so dangerous and so much the equivalent of violence. They're just going to hide behind bureaucracy. The other thing that I thought was really typical is the way that in uh, not letting me speak, the library is actually taking one side in this debate. This is not an act of political neutrality. So when I arrived in London um, yesterday, I did actually go and have a little walk around the library just because I was interested <laughs> to, uh, to find out what is this place like that I'm too dangerous to be allowed into. And the first thing that hits you is the transgender pride flag. And then you walk past the books and they've got rows and rows of the kind of I, I guess they're gearing up for Pride Month of the LGBTQ. I guess in Canada, I need to add two S onto that. Yes, but I also need to ask somebody what that stands for because we don't say that in the UK. So just LGBTQ plus, 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 plus. Uh, so they've got all the rows of books. And, you know, what this tells me is that the library is not saying, you know, we're just going to be objective and we're not going to have any speakers. We're not going to take any side in this. And they're not saying we're pro-free speech. We're going to let everybody come and speak, which would be my preference. But they're very definitely coming down on one side of this debate. They've become a politicised institution. They've come down on the side of woke. You know, the other thing that strikes me, final point I'll make on this, is that uh, um, you, you, I'll pick up on this when I come on to the talk proper. You know, a lot of people would, if I told them about everybody here this evening, you know, having such a great audience, People will say, well, what on earth was I going on about? Why has there been all this fuss over the past few days? I clearly haven't been cancelled. I have got an audience. People will be reading about this in newspapers. And so, so this is all just rubbish. You know, there isn't a cancellation. There isn't a no platforming. You know, this is just inflating a moral panic. But the fact is, it, it's absolutely wonderful to see everybody here tonight. And I'm really grateful to the hotel here for hosting us. But I actually think that libraries, as taxpayer funded institutions, as kind of homes of, of knowledge, you know, if that's not too dramatic a way of putting it, you know, the, 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 this is part of the public square. This is, the, those are the places where debates should be had out. You know, we shouldn't be coming to a hotel, however wonderful and lovely it is. It should be taxpayer funded public institutions in a democratic society that are hosting events like this. They should have a, a duty to do that. Sorry, I've just remembered one more point I want to make on this, and then I promise I will move on to the speech proper. You know, um, I actually take a lot of confidence from what's happened over the past few days. And even though my book has the title How Woke Won, 
I think what's happened with the London Public Library really shows me that they haven't won at all. Because do you know what? If they had any confidence at all in their arguments, if they were convinced for one second that they were right, they would have let this talk go ahead because the arguments would pose no threat to them. They would welcome the opportunity to be able to challenge me, to question me, to argue against what I have to say. Banning things, not letting events go ahead, is an act of intellectual cowardice. And, and what it's saying, it, it really sends a message that they don't have arguments to use against any, anything I might say this evening. Uh, they don't want to confront the reality of what I might say, and they're not convinced that they would be up to that challenge. So every time you see that an event's been no, uh, been no platformed or cancelled or a venue's pulled out, you know that that is an act of intellectual cowardice on behalf of the organisers who are not prepared to engage in a debate because they can't engage in a debate because they know they haven't got any arguments that are worth using. And I think it's only a matter of time before they're completely exposed for doing that. Anyway, right, speech popper. So this is kind of the ridiculous situation that we're up against in the UK, and I'm absolutely convinced from what I've heard today is the case in Canada as well. As I've already said, whenever you try to talk about free speech uh, or, or the problem of censorship, the problem of no platforming, the problem of speakers being cancelled, a retort you often hear is free speech crisis, what free speech crisis? This is a right wing myth. This is something you're making up. Cancelling's not real. People who claim to be cancelled actually have big platforms in other areas. The university free speech crisis has been a right wing myth for 50 years, as if this is an entire fabrication, a made up problem, a confected culture war. Interestingly, the people who say that are always the people who fire the first shots in the culture war. You know, they're always the people who say, no, you can't speak here. Why can't I speak here? How dare you wage a culture war against us? You know, that, that's how the dialogue goes. Um, you know, and again, the irony of the talk uh, this evening sex, gender, and the limits of free speech. By curtailing that, it exposes exactly where the limits of free speech are. So I know that if you want to discover if there is a free speech crisis or not, go onto a university campus, go to a library, go into the public square, and these are the things that you can't say nowadays. You can't say that a woman is an adult human female. You can't say that people cannot change sex. You can't say that there's no such thing as a transgender child. You can't say that women should have single sex spaces. It's those truths, it's that biological reality that's just considered beyond the pale nowadays. That's exactly what the limits of free speech are nowadays. Um, and, and again, you know what's happened with the library just absolutely proves that. So in the UK, it, the number one group of people, the people who are cancelled most often uh, or are no platformed no, most often, so that's invitations are issued and then withdrawn, um, are gender critical feminists, feminists who want to speak a biological truth, the reality of what it means to be a woman. Um, it's gender critical feminists who are the main target of student no platforming campaigns. You know, for the most part in the UK, these are um, mainly left wing, middle aged, middle class women. These are female academics who have historically always been on the political left. You know, these are not uh, kind of right wing firebrands. The, the, the most Oh, well, I mean, you've, that's Selena Todd there, a professor from Oxford University. These are not the type of people you would normally associate with saying dangerous things, of being at the forefront of causing offence. They're women who've often been around feminism, campaigning for women's rights for decades. Uh, one person who, woman who was no platformed, Dame Jenny Murray, you know, she BBC, um, presented Woman's Hour on Radio 4, which is kind of the blandest, you know, 
most middle class program imaginable. Uh, Julie Bindle uh, is the most no platformed feminist in the UK. You know, she's lesbian, left wing, writes for The Guardian or used to write for The Guardian. You know, these, these are not um, the people who you would imagine stereotypically would be the, the victims of no platforming. Um, so just to kind of take you back a little bit in time, actually take you back to the year I was born in, um, no platforming as a policy uh, by students um, first came about in 1974. Um, and this was the statement that was made by um, the students who were coming up with this policy. To, ach uh, to achieve this general freedom, it became necessary on many occasions to constrain some of the absolute freedoms of individuals, what was the greater freedom? An abstract notion of absolute freedom of speech or a right to live in freedom from fear of persecution. Now, this is a statement that's 50 years old. Um, you know, it's from the president of a national union of students. Um, I think it's just really prescient and kind of echoes a lot of the arguments that are still being made uh, five decades on. Um, but, but, you know, in 1974 in the UK, the backdrop to this was genuine concern about the National Front, um, about, about fasc fascism, essentially, in the UK. And the first demands for no platform, that the slogan was no platform for fascists. Now, who would have thought 50 years later, these exact same arguments, uh, the kind of playing off of one kind of freedom against, an, you know, the freedom from fear, you know, which is, is this, this is the freedom that we're, this is the way the argument's always presented. You can have this kind of rather trivial, abstract freedom of speech thing, but I mean, what does that mean? And who really cares about that? The greater freedom, the, the freedom from persecution, you know, that was the argument that was being used then. Who would have thought 50 years ago that this was the argument that was being used against, like I say, these middle class left wing um, feminist women? But, but this is where we're at. Uh, I'm just, just very quickly have a whistle stop tour through the type of people who are falling foul of censorship in universities in the UK now then. So it's not just outside speakers. So I mentioned Dame Jenny Murray, I mentioned Julie Bindell, who are not academics. These are people who were invited to universities. But we also see academics themselves barred from speaking at other universities. So this is uh, Professor Heather Brunskill Evans, sociologist, uh, gender critical feminist, works at um, uh, King's College London, has been banned from her own, speaking at her own university, not giving lectures, but speaking to students in different contexts, banned from speaking at the University of Bristol. Uh, and, and often these are talks on completely unrelated subjects. These are not even talks where uh, these professors are wanting to talk about what it means to be a woman or, or gender ideology or transgender issues in any way, shape or form. Uh, Heather Brunskill Evans was wanting to talk about pornography and the sexualization of young women. You think that would be quite an important topic to talk about nowadays. She she was banned, she was stopped from giving that talk. Uh, Selena Todd, who was on one of the previous slides, she wanted to talk about working class history, working class women and the history of working class women. Uh, again, stopped from giving that because the views expressed on a different subject in an entirely different context. But each time the arguments are the same and they're the arguments which were there on the previous slide, that these views violate a safe space policy, that they endanger um, students, I mean, children, Freudian slip there, they do act <laughs> like children, um, that they um, risk causing harm, psychological harm to people uh, who might be there. Uh, academics at their own universities. Again, this is somebody who I'm sure is familiar to everybody here. Uh, you know, this is Kathleen Stock, hounded out of her own university in October uh, 21. Uh, supposed to be speaking at Oxford University later this month. Um, it is now at the forefront of uh, the students are campaigning to have her stopped from speaking there. It's caused a huge confrontation between Oxford Union, which is the debating society, 
and the NUS in, in Oxford. Anyone who's familiar with the Oxford Union knows, you know, this is the home of numerous, well, kind of the training ground for numerous British prime ministers um, over centuries. And uh, it might lead to it being closed down altogether, could lead to it being closed down altogether uh, if it's not allowed to take a stall at the Freshers' Fair. Uh, we're really hoping that new legislation, which is going to come into force in the UK, um, a, a freedom of speech in higher education bill, uh, might overturn this and make sure that the uh, Students' Union at Oxford are not allowed to get away with cancelling the debating society in that way. Um, this is a poster which was put up at the University of Sussex. These, these were the kind of posters that Kathleen Stock was confronted with in her workplace. Uh, we're not paying £9,250 a year. Those, that's the rate of tuition fees in the UK. We're not paying this money for transphobia. Fire Kathleen Stock. And these posters were put up all around the campus. So Kathleen Stock would turn up for work and this is what she would be confronted with. I can think there's something interesting here. It's an interesting choice of slogan that the students have latched onto. And it really shows the kind of the consumer mentality um, and what students are expecting to get now in return for paying these tuition fees by, by being consumers and seeing themselves as consumers by paying all this money. What they're demanding is freedom from speech. They want to be protected. We've paid all this money and then you're going to make us confront uncomfortable views as well. You know, how dare you? We've paid all this money, so we want you just to look after us. You know, we just want little pats on the back and reassurance that everything we think is, is correct. Um, so it's a real kind of consumer demand for, for a, a psychic safety, if you like. Um, but it wasn't just posters that Kathleen Stock was, was having to confront as well. I mean, here again, uh, it became a daily occurrence at the University of Sussex. You've got these masked protesters letting out flares, the graffiti, uh, the banners here. You know, and again, the, the kind of irony that for all this talk of safety, for all the kind of hashtag be kind, for all the, the kind of insistence upon niceness and, and just looking after people, you know, the, this is not, <laughs> not an image that, that leaps out at you. Be kind. We want safety. You know, the, these are, this is vile, abusive, and, and it's intimidating. But, you know, it raises questions with me, even just looking at these pictures now, two years after um, the event was all over the, the news in the UK. Where are the adults? You know, wh why is campus security here? I I've worked at a university for long enough to know that, that campus security is a real thing. You know, you have security guards wandering around. Um, safety is a big thing on campus. But where are the adults here? You know, wh why was no one prepared to step in and stop them? carrying on in this abusive and intimidating way. You know, why, why did nobody at the University of Sussex stand up for Kathleen Stock and actually tell the students, we don't care how much money you've paid, you know, this is not a, a way to behave. Um, you know, this is not how you should be expressing yourself uh, at university. Uh, sorry, that's very, very small. I'll read some of it out. Uh, this is uh, from the Oxford University this month, and it just shows the extent to which these issues have not gone away. Uh, you know, this is coming up again two, three years later. Kathleen Stock's no longer working in a university. The Oxford University LGBTQ plus society is dismayed and appalled that the Oxford Union uh, has decided to platform the transphobic and trans-exclusionary speaker stock. She's been campaigning against trans rights. I mean, this is uh, bullshit, sorry. I mean, this, this is, it's just not true. You know, Kathleen Stock in, in defending women's rights, in saying a woman is a biological human, a bi biological adult human female, you know, that is not 
not the same as campaigning against trans rights. These are slanderous statements, um, labeling them as dangerous to women, causing for the ex calling for the exclusion of trans people from, you know, it's all hyperbolic. Uh, the union is disregarding the welfare of its LGBTQ plus, plus members. And again, I love this bit, under the guise of free speech. This is something you hear time and time again. It's almost as if nobody can possibly really believe in free speech. Nobody really thinks that academic freedom is important. And it, it's always this kind of assumption of bad faith. You're just pretending to like free speech so you can really smuggle in all these kind of transphobic, homophobic, sexist, racist things. You just want to kind of spread right wing tropes. That's why you're pretending to like free speech. Um, the idea that people could hold a genuinely principled position and, and actually genuinely think that free speech is important and want to hear other sides of the debate clearly does not cross their minds for one instant. And letting Stop bring her campaign of hate and misinformation to Oxford, allowing her to stoke fear. It goes on and on and on. You know, when I first read this, there was a, a newspaper articles at the same time um, about the, the, the kind of panic about artificial intelligence, about students using chat GPT to cheat in their um, essays and their exams. And I thought, actually, we don't need to worry about this for their exams. They're clearly using chat GPT and um, artificial intelligence to come up with their campaign slogans, because this it does look like, you know, they've put odd words into a search engine and said, you know, come up with a standard um, response to a speaker we don't like. And these are the same kind of corny old cliches we've come to expect. Um, Sorry, let's have a look where I'm at, you know. Uh, anyway, sorry, this, this is a campaign which is not just being waged against lecturers, believe it or not, these campaigns are also being waged against students. So in this instance, it's a, a student from Bristol University, uh, Raquel Rosario Sanchez, who started a feminist society. And again, when I was at university back in the day, a feminist society was a very, very normal thing that universities would have. Nowadays, it seems that if you start a feminist society and you insist that your feminist society should be for women, which, you know, doesn't seem to me to be that unreasonable, really, um, you're going to be bullied by other students. Um, you're going to be intimidated. You're going to be threatened. You're going to be uh, told to clear off and that you're not welcome on campus. And this is what has happened uh, to Raquel Sanchez, the Bristol student here, who ended up going to court to, to try and uh, get the university to defend her because it becomes yet another case of where, where you do just end up thinking, you know, where are the adults? Where are the staff? Where are the university lecturers? And, and the amount of institutional cowardice in all of this, you know, it's, it's really, really shameful. Um, but but it's it's not just cowardice. Cowardice is a big thing. And sorry, here's another one. I'm not expecting anyone to read this. I'll, I'll, I'll pick out sections of it myself. Um, it's not just institutional cowardice. As we've seen precisely as I was talking about earlier with the London Library down the road here, it is just clearly taking one side in a debate. Uh, universities have decided that, that this is, um, there's two sides to this, and they are making a very, very political decision to overlook some abuse and intimidation and to take a side. I think this is one of the most shameful things that, that came out of the whole Kathleen Stock affair. And this is what actually um, prompted Kathleen Stock's resignation. So this is a statement which was issued by um, Sussex, the University of Sussex, uh, which was where Kathleen Stock was employed. Um, this was, was a statement issued by uh, the trade union, UCU, University College Union. So the, the union, you know, which... I was a member of, you know, I, I was a, a believer in trade unions. I thought the power of trade unions for, for solidarity, for enabling staff to be able to kind of club together and demand 
their rights was something which was kind of built into me from my early childhood. It was something which I always thought was very, very important. So to see a, a trade union seeing one of their own members being victimized, abused, harassed, bullied off campus in this most obscene way, and then decide to make a statement in solidarity with the people who were dishing out the abuse, I just think is absolutely shameful. But this is what the trade union did. In light of recent events on campus and the ensuing public response on social media, we extend our solidarity to all trans and non-binary members of our community who now more than ever should receive the unequivocal support of the university and its management. You know, there, there is no statement of support with Kathleen Stock. And, and it, it was the realization that it was members of staff who were not just in the form of the union, but on social media, on Twitter as well, actually coming out to back the students and to argue against her, were encouraging the students. You know, this is something that we see more and more. Um, I very recently attended an event at, at my local university, also uh, an event actually discussing academic freedom. We were expecting students to be there protesting, uh, and that was what happened at the start of the event. What I hadn't been expecting, and perhaps this is my naivety, not anymore, but what, what I hadn't been expecting was to see a member of the university staff there uh, pointing the students to a room that that member of staff had booked for them so they could make their banners, prepare themselves for the protest encouraging them, you know, showing them the best places to go and stand and uh, coordinating the students. Uh, and in fact, not just kind of coordinating the students, but being much more uh, enthusiastic about this protest. Suddenly at the end of the evening, the students were all sat around looking a bit kind of bored and fed up. And you got the impression many of them would have far preferred to have been in the hall taking part in the debate whereas the member of staff had encouraged them to stand around outside holding these placards. But it was actually the member of staff who was not only driving, the, well, was, was driving this on. I think it's shameful. Um, it's not just that, that staff are, are organizing these events, driving students to take part, egging students on, essentially. But I think academics play an important role, even if they're not there handing out the, the felt tip pens for the students to make the, the placards. They provide an intellectual justification for students um, engaged in censoring and no platforming, campaigns of abuse. Um, they justify, they provide the intellectual and political justification for students behaving in this way. So, I mean, this is obviously a very, very famous book from decades ago now, but these ideas that words are violence, that words cause psychological, not just psychological, but physiological harm to people, the idea that any attempt to talk about these issues is the equivalent of putting your identity up for debate. It's, it's kind of a, a spirit murder is the phrase people would be familiar with from this book. It, it's, it's kind of, I mean, you, you don't get much more dramatic and hyperbolic than talking about murder using that word, do you? Um, I, I think, you know, worst of all, what staff have been at the forefront of is really institutionalizing gender ideology in particular across our universities and, and making this as if it's a, a norm, as if it's a value that, that is, is just, just to be taken for granted on campus. And again, you know, a bit of a whistle-stop tour here, the, the, how this plays out as staff reinforcing this as a norm, as a value. Um, so ethics committees are now, as I'm sure anybody here who's been involved, particularly in, uh, obviously in all kinds of research, but, but it seems to be particularly pervasive and politically slanted in social science research at the moment, where you have to um, submit your kind of entire self, it seems sometimes, to an ethics committee and get approval, ethical approval and kind of clearance uh, for what you're planning to do. Uh, and this means that you're, you're being judged essentially by other academics within your own department. 
this is a PA, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a master's student, James Caspian. He's a, a qualified um, and long-standing psychotherapist who returned to university to do a master's degree after he became aware of an increasing number of clients coming to see him in his professional practice who um, had decided to de-transition. So these were mainly young women who had um, transitioned, changed gender, and then had had regrets and had wanted to de-transition. And um, James Caspian became aware of this as a group, and, and it was a group which, this is about five, six years ago, his case was quite notable. Um, he was aware that this group, there was not much research about these women. You know, this, this was a new phenomenon, and he thought really something should be written about these people. You know, it should be looked into why had they decided to detransition? What had motivated them to transition in the first place? Why were they having the regrets? Why had they decided to detransition? Um, he, again, you know, I'm at risk of me playing the same game, you know, as a master's student, uh, James Caspian had invested tens of thousands of pounds in paying for, for his um, studies. Uh, you know, had, had been allowed to continue well into uh, the course duration. And then the ethics committee just turned around and said, no, you can't do this. Uh, it will bring the university into disrepute. We're not allowing this research to take place. And so that was the end of his master's degree program. But that's academics, you know, making a very clear distinction that some research is beyond the pale. Here's another example in the, the news far more recently. Uh, this is Laura Favaro, um, a, a um, a postgrad researcher who had been looking at uh, the experience, again, you know, the ironies here are, are just completely lost on the people who instigate these campaigns. Uh, Laura Favaro had been looking at the experiences of gender critical academics in universities. She'd been going around speaking to academics and lecturers who'd been at the forefront of these debates and, and asking them what their experiences were like, you know, what kind of problems they'd encountered. She'd done all this research. She, she'd won um, funding, a fairly substantial amount of research funding. She'd had the ethical clearance. She'd uh, gathered all this data. Uh, she then wrote a preliminary article about it in the, the Times Higher Educational uh, Supplement in the UK, a well-known higher education magazine, which is, again, a very normal thing that, that academics would do. And at that point, the university pulled the plug on it. All the data had been gathered, years of her life invested in this. Um, the university now owns the data that she has gathered. Uh, Laura has no access at this point in time to her own data. Obviously, as a postdoc, she's in a very precarious position, no prospect of having her employment contract renewed and no access to her own data. So she's not able um, to actually um, publish anything. This is kind of four years of her life wasted, numerous women's stories that she's heard that she wanted to be able to discuss in the context of, of an academic uh, research paper. Uh, all, all stopped, all, all for nothing. Uh, quick look then at uh, where, you know, what, what's the impetus for this? Where does this drive come from? And, and the, the kind of way that this acts on an, in an inst it's institutionalized. By that, I mean, it's, it's kind of written into policy documents. You know, it's something which, again, becomes part of the structure of the, of the university. I mean, the phrase we often hear talked about is kind of systemic racism. Well, I would say we've got systemic gender ideology, you know, where this is, is written into the fabric of so much of university life. So we have um, here, I, I don't think you'd have the same thing in Canada, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this is the Athena Swan Charter, it's called. Um, it's a gender equality charter, which began, um, took off really, I would say two or three decades ago. And it was about uh, essentially a campaign for sexual equality in, I'll be old fashioned enough to use that phrase, um, in higher education. So it would look at things like the the pay gap between male academics and female academics. It would look at the gap between the numbers of male professors and female professors. Um, you know, it would, was looking at the kind of inequalities in that way. But you can see from the, the final line on there, the charter is now being uh, used across the globe. So yeah, if 
it's not here in Canada yet, it soon will be, is now being used across the globe to address gender equality more broadly and not just um, barriers to progression that affect women. Now, that, that phrase there, to address gender equality more broadly, is really an indication that this is no longer about sexual equality. It's actually not about looking at pay gaps and the number of women professors versus male professors, etc. I uh, couldn't care less really about any of that anymore. It's become wholesale about gender ideology, about campaigning for gender neutral bathrooms on campus, you know, for um, doing away with all references really to um, female members of staff. Um, the horrible thing about this is that actually it ends up making this gender ideology a government-backed initiative because for universities in the UK to, to carry the title of a university, uh, they have to jump through various hoops and, and getting these charters, these kind of certificates, is one way in which they can prove um, that they are worthy of the university label. And if you don't have the university label, you can't get tuition fees from students, you don't have degree awarding powers, uh, you're finished as an institution. So it's the Office for Students in the UK uh, that ends up promoting these. And this is why we have a very contradictory uh, position, because in the UK, you know, we've had a conservative, notionally conservative government for the past 12 years now. And yet it's over that exact same period of time that all of these woke kind of schemes and ideas have become embedded within universities. Uh, and many of them actually pushed by uh, institutions that the government is, is backing and supporting. Uh, the other one I'm sure you will have all heard of um, is Stonewall. I, the, the thing that really struck me about this and the reason why I wanted to use this uh, slide here, uh, so this is University of Bristol and University of West England in Bristol, uh, proud to be a Stonewall diversity champion. Um, you know, if I kind of didn't have the political views that I have and if I wasn't involved in the type of work I did, I'd set up something like this because it's an absolute money spinner. You know, what, what these groups like Stonewall, Stonewall's not the only one, but they do it better than everybody else and they've really um, kind of set the standard here. They create these, these league tables and these schemes, you know, the diversity champion scheme. They create these, these league tables and ranking universities for uh, gender equality, kind of transgender friendly policy policies, and they put these universities in a rank order, and then they, uh, they charge universities to be included in the league tables, and then they charge them all over again for kind of training and workshops so they can tell you what you have to do in order to rise up the rankings and get onto the scheme in the first place. They make so much money. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable. But universities are, are proud to be part of this. You know, and again, to be absolutely clear, what this means when they say they're proud to be part of this is that this is not a university which is going to in any way uh, be open to debate. It, this is a university which will have uh, mixed sex toilets, mixed sex sports, mixed sex changing rooms. It's a university, I think, which would say that women's rights were not respected in any way, shape or form. But the important thing about these um, charters and, and diversity champion schemes I think, you know, it's not just what it does to the institution, which is everything I've talked about so far this evening, but the message it sends to incoming students as well. Because when incoming prospective students are browsing the websites, are looking at these charters and certificates and badges, they know the message is get on board with this. This is what you will expect when you come to the, this university. So you either put up with this or you shut up and you don't bother coming here um, at all. You know, again, here's the diversity champions program, the league tables. And again, it, it, it's all, you see these buzzwords, safe, welcomed, free to be ourselves, obviously not free to be yourself if you have particular opinions, uh, but just free to be yourself if you fall within the remit of, of what Stonewall wants. 
And, and here's what Stonewall wants. Uh, so this, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember this. This is, I think it's Northampton University, but if it says something different on there, then it's not. Um, these are the badges which are being given out, uh, the, the demand for people to include their uh, pronouns on email signatures. I mean, this is compelled speech. And, and this is something which, you know, probably somebody like me could stand up to and say, no, I'm, I'm just not doing that. But, you know, a 19-year-old student fresh out of school, or their friends are wearing these badges, or their friends are including their pronouns on the Zooms and the email signatures. You know, the social pressure to conform and do this. Uh, and, you know, the Stonewall, the people promoting these, these are the DEI um, initiative, D uh, EDI, DEI, I forget which, you know, DI. DI, whichever way you want to put it. You know, these are the diversity bureaucrats who promote these things, um, knowing full well that 19-year-old students are not going to stand up and say, I refuse to have anything to do with this, knowing that the pressure is there to conform, um, to consent, to just go along with this, to keep quiet if you disagree, not to stick your head above the parapet, uh, just to keep quiet. Um, and, and they know it sets a mood. They know it sets a tone on campus. By putting your signature, your, your, your pronoun, sorry, on your signature, by wearing a pronoun badge, you're not just saying, you know, I am a she, her, but you're saying, I might not be a she, her. You're saying this shouldn't be taken for granted, that, that I should stand here and say I'm a cis woman, you know, whatever that means. That, that you, you, you're saying that you go along with gender ideology, but you buy into all of this and it's relying on and it's encouraging um, a, a sense of conformity. It's relying on, on the inability of, of young students to say no. Uh, this filters down into the, the, not just the speakers who don't get invited, but the speakers who do get invited. You know, the, the transgender speakers, the activist speakers will massively, uh, well, easily, of course, massively outnumber gender critical speakers because the gender critical speakers are not being invited at all. Um, you know, these people have huge influence on recruitment panels. Um, they insist that um, people make these pledges either when they're applying for employment in the first place or for academics seeking promotion. It becomes almost a religious form uh, of a uh, fail to uh, feel, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm tired now. Uh, uh, kind of, you're, you're paying homage to the views you're expected to demonstrate. Um, you might be going through the motions, but the fact is by going through the motions, you're proving that you conform. Um, you're giving them the power to carry on. Um, nearly finished now. But you can see again, this uh, is the union leader of, of the academic trade union in the UK. Uh, I am proud to be the general secretary of a union that unequivocally stands with trans and non-binary people. I'm proud too that our members have returned strong policy on trans and non-binary inclusion. You know, this has just come out in the past few weeks. Uh, Joe Grady, who's the national secretary, um, you know, the union is involved in complex wage negotiations negotiations right now that they're, they're trying to campaign for higher wages for lecturers uh, and sadly you know, my husband's a lecturer so you know I'd quite like him to have a pay rise um, they're losing they're, they're not winning that fight they haven't got the weight of support on their side they haven't got the media on their side and rather than acknowledging that they're losing that fight, uh, Joe Grady comes out and makes these statements, just shifts the direction um, of the campaign and, and kind of tries to present it as if this is what all the union members think. This is, is what uh, the general kind of direction of every right thinking person in academia, this is where they're at. Um, kind of final slide here, you know, this is, this is built into the um, architecture of universities, you know, this is the entrance hall uh, to, to the, the place where the graduation ceremony was taking place on campus. Uh, Bradford, anyone who's familiar with the UK, um, has a very, very large Muslim population. Um, the, it has the highest proportion of Muslim students in the UK. Uh, and all those Muslim parents, you know, going to see their uh, student offspring graduating will be expected to kind of walk along this 
trans-inclusive pride flag uh, to gain entry into the graduation ceremony. And again, it becomes a kind of form of, of compelled speech. If you want to see your child graduate from university, you have no choice other than to um, walk along that pathway. Uh, it becomes a kind of creeping politicization of every aspect of university life. To finish off with then, I want to end on a few positives. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I, I think the very fact that all of this is happening, uh, it, it's a cowardly refusal to confront the argument, but it also suggests a lack of confidence in their ability. You know, the bans, the institutionalization is, is actually, I think, um, it's, it's a, a defeat. It's because they're not prepared to have these arguments out. If you think about other civil rights campaigns, really important civil rights campaigns, you know, that I'm sure everybody in this room would have 100% backed, you know, for racial equality, for sexual equality. These were campaigns that were mass movements that took people with them, you know, that that really um, in, involved, uh, they, they, they were won, the, these campaigns were won precisely because they depended upon democracy. They depended upon taking the majority of the people in the population with them. And that meant winning the arguments, even when that was hard, even when that seemed impossible, it meant you had to go out and you had to win the argument with people. You had to win the electorate over to what you were trying to say. Th this campaign for gender ideology is not doing that. You know, by banning, by institutionalizing, by enforcing policies, they are not having democratic arguments out with anyone. They're not building a mass movement. They're imposing some thing from the top down. Um, of course, as we've seen this evening, you know, these no platform campaigns, they actually attract way more publicity. Uh, you know, the UK, despite everything I've shown you this evening, is actually, I think, at the forefront of, of quite a pushback in this area. You know, so you kind of think, God, if all of this is going on despite the pushback, wow, what is it like in countries where there isn't that pushback? Uh, but just a few lessons from the UK then, you know, why I think we have had some successes at a national level. I think the important thing is that it's not become a party political issue. You know, um, uh, being gender critical in the UK is, is absolutely not associated with being right wing. You know, it, it's often left wing women who are really at the forefront of these campaigns. Um, I think we're very grateful to, to people like J.K. Rowling, for example, is probably the most critical, gender critical, um, most significant gender critical feminist in the UK, uh, who, who has impeccable left wing credentials. You know, there's not one left wing cause that, that she hasn't supported, um, but she's very, very much a feminist and a feminist who talks about her own experiences um, of, of domestic abuse, uh, you know, is, is clearly very authentic in what she says, but, but has paved the way, emboldened a lot of other women to speak out. Um, the other thing that I think is really great in terms of what's happening in the UK is a number of the feminists who I've named this evening, in fact, I would say all the feminists I've named this evening, kind of come at this debate from the perspective of feminism, from wanting to defend women's rights, defend single sex spaces, but they very, very, very quickly realise the importance of arguing for free speech. And I think that's a really key thing that's happened in the UK, that, that uh, 10 years ago, when I first started properly advocating for free speech, it, it was all the things I've said this evening, you know, under the guise of free speech, you just want to kind of smuggle in right-wing stuff by pretending to like free speech. But actually, these left-wing, gender-critical feminists are very much realising that free speech is important not just for smuggling in right-wing truths, you know, not that I'm, I'm wanting to do that, but, but you know, that, that everybody needs free speech. Um, so, so just a few things to finish off very, very quickly now, you know, what to do. I, I think, you, you know, everybody in this room has, has got to carry on turning out for events like this. That's great. Um, carry on inviting people to speak at events 
like this. I think the more um, invitations are issued, even if they're then refused, even if venues, eventually you think the penny will drop, that the people who are instigating these campaigns of censorship will realize, you think if they had any sense, maybe they won't, um, that, that by banning and no platforming and censoring, you know, it has the opposite effect. It generates more publicity. You know, easy to say, you know, standing here in a room, you know, of, of like-minded people, but but being, we all need to just be a bit braver, you know, and, and I think we, we all need to just be prepared to say what it is that we really think. Um, unfortunately, one lesson I do take away um, from the union, the way the union in the UK has carried on, is that we need to perhaps develop new forms of solidarity. I know it was one of the conversations we were having today. I'm not sure about new institutions, but, but new uh, campaign groups. We've got the Free Speech Union in the UK, Academics for Academic Freedom. And these are groups which have kind of acted on top of unions and on top of institutions to really generate a groundswell of support um, and, and have, have helped promote stories within the media, attract attention and publicity for the cause of free speech. But I think time and time again, you know, the, the important thing is that we make the case for free speech as being absolutely crucial to arguing for equality, for challenging oppression, um, you know, for, for really saying that if we want to see a more equal society, then actually free speech is in everybody's interest. And that's the beauty, isn't it? Everybody here knows that, that that's the beauty of arguing for free speech. It doesn't take one side in a political debate. Free speech helps everybody. In fact, I'd go so far as to say the most oppressed people in society are the people who need free speech most of all. And, and by making that point, I think we can hopefully slowly begin to take back places on the committees, on the institutions, and almost, we almost need to instigate a, a reverse long march through the institutions um, for people who are prepared to make the case for free speech. Uh, but yeah, very, very happy to take any questions or comments. My, my, my question is about irony. Your, your talk is thick with irony. It starts with the London Public Library and then all the way through. And you mentioned how the irony has been lost on many of the people who are conducting these campaigns. This quote, which I think you said was from 1974 or so, strikes me as the kind of statement that at the time would have been used to in to to restrict free speech on the subject of feminism and women's rights and my question is is it your impression that the modern feminists appreciate the irony of the situation they are now in given that the shoe is now on the other foot oh that i mean that <laughs> That's a, a very, very good question. I mean, I can tell you just because I, you know, know the context to this quote, I, I, I kind of obviously did the reading around it and did the cut and paste. Uh, this it, it was not um, meant about women's rights and feminism. It was in the context of fascism, blah, blah, blah. But I do completely take your point. Uh, I've written very critically of feminism in the past. You know, my book, Women Versus Feminism, is very critical. I, I wrote that back in 2016 before the uh, kind of gender ideology movement properly took off. And the kind of feminism I'm criticizing is what was referred to at the time as the, the kind of fainting couch feminism, the kind of victim feminism. And I was very critical of uh, middle class, powerful women who then kind of appropriated, as I saw it, the victimhood of the genuine um, disadvantages, if you like, experienced by working class women to kind of make the case that their already kind of good lives should get even better. Anyway, sorry, no, it's the answer to your question. <laughs> I, I don't think they. I don't think that irony has hit home. Yeah, there was a debate a couple of weeks ago on YouTube between Tim Pool. I assume you know who that is, right? Uh, he was arguing that social media algorithms drove the wokeness, and wokeness doesn't have any content; it's just about power. 
And Bogot, Peter Bogosian, who argues that in the late 80s, it came out of intersectional theory. I, I'm sure this is in your book, but <laughs> uh, do, you have a, do you have a side there? Do you think either one is more right than the other? Um, I, I think woke is actually very powerful. Um, and I think it's, it's got the cultural power. Uh, I think woke I, ideas obviously are, are abstract, but, but it's the people who embody those ideas that have, have uh, captured, is the word, isn't it? That all the cultural institutions in society, it seems to me, you know, from university, schools, museums, art galleries, the media, you know, film, theater, et cetera, uh, and the, the people who are running those institutions have swallowed um, woke ideas uh, completely and, and are using the power that they have through those institutions to uh, bypass democracy, which is my problem with all of this, and, and inst uh, inflict those ideas, impose those ideas on the rest of society. So I don't think it's just a social media algorithm thing. I think it, it's a very real uh, problem that we all have to confront. Christina. Uh, first of all, thank you for a really fascinating talk. Um, you were mentioning at the beginning how essentially being cancelled by the library actually gives you a broader audience and that kind of stuff. And I do have to agree with the people who say there is no really cancelling because in countries like I grew up in East Germany, if you had been cancelled, you wouldn't be here. You would be somewhere in jail. <laughs> so, um, but that brings me to something that I find actually is really sinister that is going on right now. So people who are trying to cancel you are not evil governments or even evil administrators. At one point you were asking, so where are the adults here? That kind of stuff. So people that are trying to cancel you, it's kind of like coming from the bottom up. And that makes it so much harder to actually really deal with that in a convincing way, because the moment you do that as an accomplished uh, speaker, academic, and so on, you immediately will be accused of, well, you're using your power, your power imbalances, and all that kind of stuff. And of course, the people who are asking for the cancellations, and essentially asking for more oversight over who gets to speak. They have this idea that everybody will agree with them. You are absolutely right, they don't have good arguments because they don't need good arguments. Mm -hmm. It's not they are afraid or they know I, I don't need a good argument. All I scream is transphobic and out the door you are. But the problem with that is obviously any clever government can exploit I mean, like you, at the end, you have this, this uh, rainbow crosswalk kind of thing. In East Germany, our governments, they would have loved that if the people themselves actually had offered that. So, like, are you really as optimistic as you were? <laughs> I try. I change on an hourly basis between whether I'm pessimistic or optimistic. Uh, thank you. I, 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 you know, take on board a lot of what you're saying there. Um, I'm not completely convinced about this being a bottom-up thing in the sense that I don't think it's the majority of people in society. To use a kind of horrible phrase, I don't think it's ordinary people who are calling for these things. I mean, th this censorship, it might not be coming from kind of always, I mean, not sometimes in the UK it is, coming from uniform police officers, um, or, or that's the ultimate um, uh, power that lies behind it, hate speech, hate crime, non-crime hate incidents we have in the UK, which can often, the reality is, it can mean a police officer knocking at your door. Um, but it's, it's not bottom up in the sense of a groundswell of public opinion demanding these cancellations. Uh, it, it is actually powerful people who may not be the police officers or the, or the kind of armed wing of 
the state, but are the cultural elite in charge of institutions. And I think, you know, the, the point I draw out in, in my book, How Woke Won, is in and how these people um, kind of deny the very power that they possess. So they're some of the most powerful people in society. And again, to use the word I was, I was using to, to answer your question about feminism in the past, uh, at the back, you know, they, they appropriate kind of victimhood. They, they try to present themselves as being this kind of oppressed minority. And actually, they are exceedingly powerful and are able to enforce that cultural power whilst denying the very power that they possess, whilst trying to point the finger at other people and saying, you know, no, you're the one who's dangerous, who's powerful, etc. Uh, and yet they, they are, are the ones who, who are able to do that. On the kind of not cancelling because it's taking place here, you know, sure, I, 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 take, I do absolutely take that on board and I'd far rather be standing here than be in a prison camp or in a, a prison cell, you know, and that's a really, really important distinction and an important point to make. But again, I think it comes back down to, for me, this fundamental question of what are libraries for? You know, what are universities for? I mean, for me, um, you know, absolutely fundamentally, universities should be places for the free exchange of ideas. You know, they should be the places where these debates are being had out, where, where no ideas are off limits, where people can, can debate all kinds of things freely. They should be intellectually, uh, intellectually exciting places, but also places, and I think this is vitally important for young people in particular, young students, 19, 20, 21 year olds, to be able to experiment, um, to be able to take risks, to be able to to say things without fear of, of reprisal and consequences and then change their minds. You know, that's a kind of healthy, to me, that should be a health, certainly that was me when I was kind of 19, 20, 21. And the idea now that there are such severe consequences for saying the wrong thing, I think stops that intellectual risk taking and experimentation and it stops the free exchange of ideas. And yes, you know, you might be able to have the debates in a newspaper column or, or in a hotel room, but, but it kind of, really takes away what a university should actually be about. Very quick follow-up then, Christina. Yeah, um, I fully agree with you that the, the powerful people are the ones that are in charge. But what they have managed to do is get an army of young students, unexperienced students. Right now we have this uh, black queen's story hour thing where already little kids are basically indoctrinated with that. And they are the foot soldiers in that army who are actually doing a lot of the dirty work for them. Uh, you know, again, I agree. I agree. I'm not going to disagree with that. But I wonder, and again, if I, you know, optimistic, pessimistic, optimistic, pessimistic, always changing my mind. I do wonder, particularly for young people, and again, as a symptom of not actually having been convinced by any arguments, but just having this imposed upon them, how deeply these views are really held. You know, they know what they have to say. They know the badge they have to wear. They know the, e the um, email signature that they have to have. But, but it's not as if they've actually really been convinced of anything I'm not I'm not saying this for everybody but for, for lots of them who I come into contact with you know I, often when they hear me talk it's like wow nobody has ever challenged them before you know they have never ever heard anybody put forward a counter argument um, and partly that comes back to the cowardice which I've been talking about throughout um, but, but it's like nobody has thought to challenge them and as soon as they do then get asked serious questions about why they think what they claim to think it crumbles, you know, that there's not a lot of substance behind it. Not for all of them, but for some of them, a decent proportion. I think there's not much substance behind it. Um, Lisa and then Boris. Oh, you didn't have a question? Okay, uh, Boris, and then, and then we'll come up front. Good. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. Um, to what extent do you think the decline in free speech is an effect of the deplorable state of liberal education? the very great disrespect for the most wonderful cultural achievements of the past, philosophy, literature, art, music, and so on, this seems to be, ironically, speaking of ironies, a consequence also of progressivism. 
Yeah, no, I, I would very much see those things going hand in hand. Um, I'm, I won't say too much because it's very much the, the topic that I want to come on to talk about tomorrow. Um, but, but, you know, when you ask what, what has replaced, what, what, are, what are children getting at school if they're not getting an education in the classics, in the grades, if they're not getting an education that is extending them and challenging them intellectually, it, it's indoctrination. Instead, an indoctrination um, doesn't prepare prepare anybody for engaging in debate. It doesn't um, prepare them not only to, to, they have no idea of the value of free speech, but they're unable to deal with free speech as well. It, it's not a part of their education at all. I think you're absolutely right. Come here. Yeah. So um, thank you very much for the presentation. So um, the question that I have is kind of a tangential question. Um, so um, uh, you alluded to some of the um, um, ethical codes or codes of ethics that uh, are used in the uh, licensing bodies or uh, whatnot. My question is, um, are there any uh, sorts of developments in other professions? So say nursing professionals or psychotherapy or, um, or even uh, physiotherapy. So the places where they have immediate exposure to these kinds of things. Have there, any, uh, have there been any kind of uh, codes of ethics developed specifically with regards to gender and, and all the rest of the things that come with it? You mean to allow this kind of research to take place in other contexts? Not only for research, but also for professionals as well. So, uh, so someone who engages in these kinds of, uh, uh, someone who pursues a kind of career, uh, career in these environments or in these uh, 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 essentially professions, they have to now, uh, adhere to specific rules, specific concrete rules in order for them to... To, to uh, practice. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, no, I, I, unfortunately, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I mean, we've got to remember, I'm sure it's the same in Canada, but certainly in the UK, uh, universities are not just the place for undergraduate education, but universities are the centre of professional training for uh, psychotherapists, for nurses, doctors, uh, you know, teachers, um, all the professions. You, the, the university universities are being trained here and you know everything I've talked about this evening I, or free speech or women's rights etc you know all of these things are, are important I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't think they were important but I think the thing above all that that horrifies me most of all that I, I know is happening in universities in the UK where people on nurse training course programs training to be nurses for example are also being taught on a program to teach them how to become a nurse um, that there are no, no such thing as there's not two sexes, you know, that, 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 that it's gender identity that trumps sex, that, that it's somebody's, um, that, that, that women are not adult human females, essentially, is, is what I'm trying to say, you know, and, and how do you then go out into the real world and practice being a nurse if you can't say that a woman has a cervix, you know, has a vagina, that there are these biological differences between males and females that are of absolute crucial importance to, to medical practice? It, it's, I mean, that's just horrifying. Very quick, Amir. Yeah, so just a quick follow-up. <laughs> the, uh, has there been any developments in the, in the, in the grounds of um, uh, conscientious objections to these sorts of ethical codes? Because I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that is the kind of the next battle ground in the whole uh, arena. Uh, not that I know of. I wish I could stand here and say yes, but not that I know of. I mean, I think this is where you see how these debates for academic freedom, you know, have been taking place over decades, you know, a hundred years, more than a hundred years, academics have been fighting for academic freedom. The problem is the arguments for academic freedom are, are remain the same, but, but the causes of the threats to academic freedom just change. You win one argument, another argument pops up. You win one argument, you know, another one pops up. And, and and I think the problem we face today, as I've been illustrating, is that the threats to academic freedom are coming from within within universities, aren't they? I mean, this has been the case for, for a number of years now, but it's within universities that, that these problems are emerging. So it's it's not a kind of external imposition, you know, like if you think of McCarthyism or things that were happening in East Germany, you know, where it was coming from outside. These are from within the institutions themselves of people kind of policing um, 
um, each other and it becomes much harder then, I think, to fight back against within ethics committees and things like that because it's your colleagues, essentially, who you would be challenging. Yes. Yeah, um, so I haven't been here for the whole conference, so I'm just taking this uh, presentation on face value. Um, and a lot, a lot of what you're talking about is the undermining of the idea of the public square, right? Not having that open space. Absolutely. And from what I'm gathering, the whole thing with SAFs is the university should be that place, right? My question to you, and I guess the group generally too, as we discuss, um, is the university still that public square? Has it shifted somewhere else? Right? So that's the first part of the question is, is it still the public space? Right? And then the second question is, if it's not the public space anymore, what is? Yeah. No, again, that, I mean, that's a huge question. And I'm sorry, you're probably not going to be here tomorrow. But again, it's really what I'm talking about tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I, the, um, the short answer to your question is no. You know, I don't think universities are operating as a public square or a public space in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, to me, the, the very, very short answer to your question, and I can only apologise, you know, maybe if we get a chance to talk more later, uh, the, the purpose of a university should be education and, and the public square square element of debate is to enhance and to, to act as a marketplace of ideas to the benefit of pursuing knowledge, furthering the pursuit of knowledge, furthering intellectual muscles, if you like, right. developing people's intellectual muscles. Um, they stop doing that because they give up on education and they're substituting indoctrination for education. When you're indoctrinating rather than educating, you actually don't want people to be <laughs> exercising their intellectual muscles because as soon they exercise their intellectual muscles, they're questioning, they're challenging, they're thinking critically. If you're indoctrinating, you just want people to accept. Yeah. So where do you think that public space is now? Oh, well, I, oof. I mean, I would say social media, but we know that social media is subject to just the same right. kind of... So, so that, that, that's essentially what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Is there sort of a, a non or a neutral public space anymore? <laughs> I, I wish I, I, the fact that I can't answer that question easily, you know, I think um, I, in a, a utopian idea of tech, I mean, at once uh, Jack Dorsey, I think, said that Twitter would be the free speech yeah. wing of a free speech part. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that lasted all of two minutes, didn't it? And then that was abandoned. And, you know, no, I can't think of any. I mean, in, in the UK, you know, so much of, of what people say is now subjective to hate speech um, legislation, non, you know, even if you don't commit a crime, non-crime hate incident, if it's not Twitter that censors you or Facebook that censors you or bans you, you could very, very, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, it, it's a beggar's belief. I almost can't, even I have to convince myself that this is actually true. But yeah, you could have the police, police are sitting there monitoring what people say. I know personally women who are involved in um, gender promotion in kind of gender critical feminism who routinely have the police knocking on their door uh, you know they'd be at home preparing dinner for their children there's a knock on the door and the police are there oh you've been reported for a hate crime hate speech you know we're coming to investigate you can you come down to the police station with us I mean this I wish I was making this up you know this is a reality of, of what's going on in the UK right now Stephen Thank you very much. Ironically, you know, the people that are still, that are these totalitarians are still talking about how oppressive the police are when they've got the police under their wings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is kind of, uh, kind of a broad question. Uh, people, we talk about all the time about where this comes from. You know, some people say cultural Marxism. My friend Francis says it has nothing to do with Marxism. Certainly, in many ways, it doesn't. Campbell and Manning write an interesting book on victimhood culture. I kind of wonder if there's, once in a while, if there's some sort of Wizard of Oz character running this in the background. <laughs> because everything is asking words. You know, free speech used to be the left. Mm -hmm. Racial segregation used to be bad. Uh, yeah. And gender ideology, I mean, it's not an obvious social justice issue to go to for it to be this big. So if you think about the other issues beyond gender ideology, if you think about race and 
indigenous issues and so on. Have people, have the people with the power lost sight of what they're doing, do you think? What's, what's the end game here? <laughs> Well, again, these are huge questions, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give a soundbite answer. I mean, just to say, uh, Francis, you know, I'm 100% with you. I, I don't think this is cultural Marxism. You know, I, I don't think this has got any, it's cultural, but I, I, don't, I don't see Marxism in, in this in any way, shape or form. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, for me, Marxism is, is fundamentally uh, an analysis based on economics and social class. You know, this isn't, it has nothing to do with social Social class is a very, very blunt and crude answer to that. But, but where I think I completely agree with you is, you know, this 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 kind of woke ideology brings back everything that I've spent my entire life fighting against. You know, it rehabilitates the racialization of society. It forces people to see each other as members of a racialized group. When for me, you know, the progressive idea was that you move beyond that. You don't judge people according to the color of their skin. Now we're being told once more that the first thing, if you don't see skin color, then there's something wrong with you. You're a bad person. You should judge people by the color of their skin. It rehabilitates misogyny in the most crude and, and kind of horrible way. You know, women are being told to shut up, stop banging on about your rights. You know, uh, why would you want to have a single sex space? All these kind of ideas that I'm, as far as I'm concerned, progressives argued against are being brought back and being brought back in a really, really ugly form. Uh, I, you know, if there was a Wizard of Oz character driving all of this, life would be so much easier for us because we'd just have to kind of point out that figure, you know, pull the curtain back, say, look, there he is, job done. You know, if only it were that simple. Um, but I think the important point to make is that some people in society are massively gaining from these ideas. It's not me, it's not us, it's not the people in this room. I, I don't think it's women, I don't think it's black people, I don't think it's even transgender people. I think it is uh, the kind of new professional managerial class, the DEI bureaucrats who, who again kind of point to um, victim groups. They're not victim groups themselves, but can kind of point to groups that they think are being victimized, appropriate that, take the moral high ground, enforce their own power. You know, um, when we didn't have DEI bureaucrats running universities, but we had personnel managers, people watched you kind of clock in and clock out. It was your time that the university wanted or your workplace wanted. Now they want your soul, you know, and, and when they've got your soul, they've got your heart, they've got you, they've got so much more of you than just the hours that they used to have before. And so it hands an awful lot of power over to this group in society. And, and that's what I think people are getting out of it. Yeah, cool, thank you. Um, so I'll try to be quick, basically. <clears throat> Speaking about ironies, um, I took two classes, or like four classes in total. Two classes about one professor, one in human rights, the other in Canadian immigration history. And basically, I ended up getting canceled as a whole process, right? Like I took a holy day off, and basically at the end of it, based on two emails, I was banned from the university. And to get back into university, I got to attend anti-abuse training, like anti-abuse women training. When I didn't join my professor, the last thing I said to her was, sorry for not coming to class, it's a holy day. I'm not comfortable coming to King's Campus today, I just got to take that day off. And I ended up getting counseled. So basically, I guess what I'm looking for is advice, because everything you said, I've been through it in the last four months. I've talked about gender norms, because I thought it was comfortable to do so. I was just like, hey, we should be quick to jump to norms, because we're living in like an experiment right now, right? Technology, who knows what's going to happen. I don't think, like, you know, like, who knows what the nature of work is going to be like. At the end of the day, people want to spend time with their families, that type of thing. I wasn't really trying to push any buttons. But my, my professor is talking about me on Twitter. She, in her Twitter echo chamber, made me anti-woke, right? And there's, like, her echo chamber is pretty much saying you should write a something, like, just con write down everything that he says, right? So I talk about how Black Lives Matter got hijacked, how they didn't really win, right? And she's like, oh, no, they did. I'm like, what? Prove it, right? So she was shut down the debate. That's when I said anything, right? So there was nothing like, like, there's no critical thinking involved at all. They just wanted to prove a point. And whenever I talk about how I face, you know, like, they're talking about, like, women's harassment, these, these types of things. I'm like, we struggle with men's harassment as well. Like, I got sexually harassed a bunch of times. And I said that. I said, like, like I put out my victim experiences. None of you was talking about it at all. Now I have to attend anti-abuse training to get back on campus. I was in school to graduate. I was going to graduate at the end of the summer, 
they're filling all my courses. It was hard to get a lease. A thousand dollars a month here is not cheap. So I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like I, I don't even know what law I can use. I have no. I, I got canceled hard. Right? So, I'm super Well, I mean, I would say sorry. And I'm really, I think it's horrific, the situation you're finding yourself in. I wish you were the first person I'd heard say this kind of thing, but unfortunately you're not. I've heard other people say similar things. I'm probably not well-placed to give you, I'm not well-placed to give you specific advice, but I, I kind of have a feeling there might be other people in the room who may perhaps be able to help you more than I can. Um, again, you know, just, just what you say to me really rings alarm bells with the word training. Um, again, you know, when you think about the purpose of, of what the purpose of a university should be, and this idea that that kind of you know, these compulsory training courses and training is not an intellectual exercise that speaks to the possibility of disagreement or speaks to the possibility even of critical thinking. Training is get in line. This, these are the correct answers. You know, the the idea that you're going on a training course suggests from the outset that there are right and wrong answers and you have to re learn and recite the correct answers. Uh, similar uh, occurrences in the UK of people, uh, students being pushed into mandatory diversity training um, programs at the outset of their degree program and um, for other stu universities I know before they're allowed to advance kind of from first to second year you know that they have to take a sexual harassment training course nothing to do with the subject content of their degree you know they could be a grade students throughout but haven't taken the online multiple choice um, sexual harassment training course and so are not allowed to progress on it's compelled I, I, you know I'd go so far to say it's an abuse of power, it's an abuse of institutional power uh, to coerce you into having to have a particular mindset, a particular set of views. I certainly think talking about you on Twitter um, is, is absolutely an abuse of power. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. One thing, question. Uh, I think we have time for one last question before uh, we wear uh, Joanna out. Yes. Um, I just wonder why this issue is not seen in the context of our corporate uh, lack of interest in uh, family dynamics and uh, the, if you're talking about institutional support, uh, the elimination of sex is a great facilitator of having good laborers. So I don't understand why that's not a part of the whole discourse, for one. Yeah. Um, you mean, in, you mean? At the highest level, yeah. why, why is this going on? And what's the nature of the institutional support that, what's it come from? Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you know, uh, actually there's a significant movement against uh, families and, um, you know, this is, has to do with um, population collapse. But it's workers with families get in the way, their families get in the way of their work. And that's just a basic thing, which I don't see why that wouldn't be considered a factor in the attempt to basically eliminate Sex. Yeah, I mean, again, huge, huge issue. I'm afraid, sorry, I'm not going to even pretend to do it justice now. You know, my in my brain, it's kind of three o'clock in the morning now. So I say, but, 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 you know, I, in terms of I kind of matches with the question over here about what's driving all this, what's behind it. I, uh, you know, I think I think there's a, a misanthropy behind it. There's a, a, a hatred, a loathing of, of people, a sense that if you let people kind of loose and just kind of reach their own conclusions about these issues they're bound to be kind of the most horrible you know we need to control it's a, an authoritarian drive to control um, but I think these people who are controlling uh, you know pushing these agendas they are hostile to family life and I think that's to me is one of the biggest drivers of, of trans ideology I mean sex is the one of the most base well the most basic fundamental fact about who we are, isn't it? It's it's kind of the first thing that we often learn about who we are, you know, after we've learned our name, you know, by the age of, of four at the oldest, you know, most children, two, three, four, can tell you their name, tell you that they're a boy or a girl. And it, that then goes on in, in many, not obviously not all, but in many instances to form the basis of relationships, of family. It's the building blocks of who we are as people and, and 
and how we form families and, and how we socialize a new generation. And, and by challenging that with gender ideology, you get to challenge the most fundamental aspect of what makes us human and how we organize human society. And, and I think the people who are pushing this agenda are 100% aware that that's the power it gives them. And, and I do think that that is what's driving it. They have no interest in promoting family life, that they think that they're hostile to family life, I, I think. Thank you very much, Joanna. <laughs>